Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And good evening and, and welcome to the um, President's Lecture in 2019. Um, I would like to introduce Andrew Tyler, um, our 117th President um, as of our AGM earlier this morning. Um, Andrew was a uh, hydrographic and oceanographic surveyor with BMT and he completed a part-time PhD in marine pollution in 1999 and in 2001, he became the managing director of BMT Defence Services, the designers of the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers, uh, while also supporting the engineering of the in-service submarine flotilla. He finished his BMT career as operations director and joined the Ministry of Defence as the chief operating officer in defence equipment and support. And there he was responsible for the acquisition of just about every programme that was going, uh, including the carriers, Type 45s and many others. In 2011, he moved on to uh, Marine Current Turbines, where he was managing director of what was then the world's leading tidal energy company. And that company was then sold on to Siemens in 2013, where he then moved on to be Chief Executive Europe of Northrop Grumman, and in 2018, he became the chief executive of Algecko Group, the world's largest modular space company. As well as a fellow of IMRS, Andrew is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, a chartered surveyor, chartered marine scientist, chartered engineer, a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and a member of the Royal Corps of Constructors. Andrew's uh, lecture tonight is Life and Times, 25 years, in the IMRS. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, and this is obviously a tremendous honor to be with you tonight. And thank you so much for all, to all of you for, uh, for turning out this evening. Um, this might be one of those things that they call something entirely different because I did struggle to find a topic to talk to you about. Um, so somewhat self-indulgently, and I hope you will forgive me, um, I thought I would spend this evening just giving you a little bit of a taste of some of the things I've been up to. But underneath this is really a very serious point about the IMRS as possibly if not the, then one of the most interdisciplinary um, professional institutes um, in existence. And I've been spectacularly fortunate, as I think you will see, and it really is a matter of, of luck, I always feel in these things, to have been able to dip in to many, many areas across the IMRS um, spectrum. Uh, the risk I'm taking is that I've always promised myself, whenever I do any events like this, that I will only talk on subjects that I know more than everybody else in the audience. On this occasion, I think I can pretty much bet that somebody in the audience will know more about each individual topic that I'm talking about. Um, so I'll apologize to all of those individuals um, right up front. Um, the picture, by the way, is uh, me and Paul Stein, who a lot of you probably know, currently um, the CTO at Rolls-Royce, but formerly, and when that picture was taken, the chief scientific advisor in the uh, MOD on uh, our little trip out in a, um, a T-class boat. Um, I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was quite a long time ago. Um, so as I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a little journey, um, sort of vaguely chronologically in what I've been up to, but covering coastal engineering, environmental issues, maritime trade and, and shipping, offshore oil and gas, uh, renewable energy, maritime defense, um, and climate change. Um, and then I will try and keep my remarks um, reasonably expeditious, and then happy to take questions at the end, except from those experts in the room who know more about all those topics I'm going to talk about. Um, so this is kind of where it started. It started uh, actually a few weeks after I left uni, where um, my boss left, and as he went out the door, he said there's some uh, rock groins up at Clacton uh, in Essex, and we're doing some surveys to monitor how they're getting on, and I uh, can't tell you much about it, but the job's yours now. Um, so we took some survey boats up there, and I spent a happy summer surveying uh, these rock groins. And essentially what we were trying to do was to see whether they were doing a half-decent job of uh, protecting Clacton from disappearing into the, uh, into the North Sea. Um, the answer was they were doing actually quite a good job, but in doing so they'd shifted the problem about five miles down the coastline. Um, and I guess what I really learnt 
at the beginning, and, and, I, and, I, and I think this was great because although I had spent three years messing about in boats in Plymouth, which at the end of it apparently constituted a degree, um, getting your hands dirty and getting practical, particularly with anything to do with the sea, is super important because as my career has progressed, man versus ocean has been a bit of a theme. And what I learned here was you can try but you are ultimately doomed to failure. And trying to protect coastlines, like for example the one uh, on the east coast of the UK, is the definition of a, of a losing battle. It is definitely Canute trying to hold the sea back. So a lot of very early lessons about, you say, pitting myself, um, or I should say humans, pitting themselves against the forces of the sea. So just moving on then to a chapter in my career, um, which I had a huge amount of fun, um, and that was in the whole sphere of marine pollution. Um, spent 10 years uh, doing a lot of work in the oil spill response arena, and this was in an era when not very long went past without a pretty significant oil spill incident. Um, and you go back to, you know, when I was born in the year of the Torrey Canyon, and you chart that forward, Exxon Valdez, you know, a massive moment uh, in terms of the um, of oil spills. Um, and this one, which I'm, uh, you know, I think was, I think I'm right in saying was the, the last or the, the latest of the very large spills in this country, but this was back in 96, uh, which was Sea Empress um, on the South Wales, the Pembrokeshire coast. Um, this was quite late on in my time in the oil spill response business, but it also happened to be an oil spill in the place where I'd taken my family holidays throughout the entirety of my childhood. So I actually knew just about every single beach that was contaminated because I had fished in the rock pools and I'd played on the sand. So this was quite a, a personal oil spill to me, if you can have such a thing. Um, I think there was a couple of things that I took out of this. Um, one was that, and I'll come on to the flip side of this, is that the environment does have quite an assimilative capacity, despite what we do to it. Um, and you can go back now, in fact, you could have gone back many years ago to these beaches in South Wales, and there isn't the slightest leftover um, impact from what was quite a serious oil spill um, at the time. Um, but the other thing I would say is that whilst, you know, you're never that far away potentially from an oil spill, huge credit to the maritime industry in general, shipping industry, maritime industry, IMRS and many organizations like us, who sorted the problem out in very large part. And we, it's very rare now to have the big catastrophic oil spills of this sort. Probably now the most likely source of an oil spill of this nature would be a blowout um, in an, in an offshore, um, uh, offshore production facility. Um, so I say, a lot, of, a lot of my time spent um, in the oil spill business. Um, as uh, Rob mentioned at the beginning, um, I did a part-time PhD. Um, it actually, I think, was near enough on record for the longest PhD at the University of Plymouth, um, which probably goes, says, says something else other than I was doing other things at the time. Um, but basically, I spent eight years of my life studying um, this bit of here, um, and looking at how organochlorines, and at the time the focus was around polychlorinated biphenyls um, and dioxins, uh, which are the, is what I studied, um, looking at the way that these um, chemicals, these very um, hydrophobic lipophilic chemicals, um, attach to sediments. Um, my colleagues at the university used to joke with me because one of the experiments I was doing in the lab was using um, what was, is generally regarded as the most carcinogenic um, compound known to man, um, 2378 tetrachlorinated biphenyl, uh, dioxin rather, sorry, and um, I, I was using a carbon-14 carbon labelled version of it, so not only was it the most potent carcinogen known to man, but it was also radioactive. And they all said to me, you know, that'll be your, you know, no children in your life, um, when my partner then promptly produced twins, so that just showed them. Um, but as I, I guess the story here was, you know, I was studying this little element right up here in the way you do when you're doing a PhD, but I was very interested in the big picture as well. And that was a picture that illustrated both 
bioaccumulation in a, in a very acute way. And you see that very neatly from this slide where you'll start off at you know, a, 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 an organic contaminant at whatever that is, um, two times 10 to the minus six, and you'll end up with 160 in a seal. So incredible accumulative capacity. And that is basically because these things dissolve in fat. So they attach to the fat in the sediment, they go into the fat, 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 and if you're a seal, you're renowned for being fat, and you eat a lot of fish, which are quite fat, um, and so it goes on. And, and, and I think the other thing that, it, it, that came home to me was this issue of global transportation of these contaminants. Because what you actually found was that in the Arctic Circle, the Inuit had the highest body burden of organochlorines than any other population on the planet, and yet they were pretty much the furthest away from the source of any population on the planet. So these compounds were coming out of whatever the source was, incineration or manufactured pentachlorophenol or something like that, and being transported atmospherically and in the marine environment up to these northern climes, and then bioaccumulation took over. And if you're an Inuit, you know, you're eating a lot of this and quite a bit of this. And then, of course, the Inuit mothers were, were actually the next step beyond that because they were then passing super high concentrations onto their babies through their breast milk. So it, it was a, a real seminal time for me, even though I was only dealing with that little tiny bit up in the top left-hand corner. Um, again, I think mankind can sort of take a little bit of a shout out here for, I think, controlled substances, heavy metals, um, some of these organochlorines um, and other organic um, you know, pesticides and so on. We've done a pretty good job in eliminating them at source, which is all you really can do, even though there are a lot of reserves uh, locked up in sediments. But this is the new one. And um, it's been interesting as this has gathered momentum, um, particularly thanks to a certain um, uh, Sir David Attenborough, um, and quite rightly so. Interestingly, I was studying um, phthalite esters back in the late 1990s with uh, BP Chemicals up on the Humber. Uh, that, that's the, the compound in the plasticizer that goes into plastics. Um, and we were working with a namesake at Brunel University, um, Paul Tyler, um, who was looking at Impersex due to phthalite esters, these plasticizers, plasticizers um, in these plastics, uh, which were causing this sort of asexual um, distortion in, um, in, uh, in small animals. Um, and so here we are, though, you know, all of a sudden, this is now the issue of the day. Well, actually, it's not the issue of the day. It's been the issue of the last X decades, but obviously it's now risen to the top. The thing that worries me about this one is, and we heard it this afternoon, um, and we'll hear it again tomorrow, is the mind-bending scale of this. I mean, it, the amount of plastics in the ocean is just breathtaking. And I, I, to my point about the assimilative capacity of the environment, I think we've certainly, let me put, let me put it this way, in all the experiments that mankind has visited upon the uh, marine environment, I think this one is really, really going to test the, uh, the envelope of the ability of the environment uh, to absorb um, similarly, um, sensitive environments, highly sensitive environments. So I spent um, three or four years working with um, a very enlightened oil company um, who was producing right up at the north end of this island chain. This is, for, a lot of you will recognize this, the Pulo Palo Cerebu, the Thousand Island Chain, uh, stretches north Jakarta up into the um, West Java Sea, um, and spent a lot of time, say, more up the top end, um, from looking at both oil spills, but also looking at the impact of produced waters from offshore production platforms where they were producing, you know, nine times as much produced water as they were oil, and this produced water was just going straight back into the ocean, literally, you know, 10 or 20 miles away from these highly sensitive um, environments. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen around the world, Great Barrier Reef probably being the sort of um, symbolic or totemic example at the moment um, of what happens when you take a very sensitive environment and highly stress it. And there you've got an environment that's getting both a very acute impact from things like tourism. I mean, the, 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 the simple physical damage caused to reef systems from too many people snorkeling and diving on them. And then obviously the climate change, you know, the, the, the chronic risk from climate change, warming the oceans um, and, and getting a lot of acidification and coral bleaching uh, and so on. And although every now and then there's, you know, little bits of hope that some of these reefs are recovering, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist knowing how long they took to grow in the first place to know even if you stopped today impacting them, 
how long it's going to take them to, to get back on their feet again. And the one little example I often use, um, not related necessarily to this, but just of tipping points, and you know, we've heard this term tipping points a lot. This is where I think mankind will finally you know, get its comeuppance. It won't be, I think, from a chronic impact. It will be from things in the environment going over their tipping point. And you know, again, the, probably the most famous one at the moment is the, is the cod stocks on the Grand Banks um, <laughs> off Newfoundland, where they got fished and fished and fished. And then, to put it bluntly, one day, mummy fish couldn't find daddy fish anymore, and the population just plummeted at that point. And although I think there are some signs that it's, it is recovering, having essentially banned all fishing from the area, and I guess there's been some migration of some stocks into that area, that has taken, you know, two decades, um, and even then it's nothing like it was um, in the first place. And then at the sort of macro level, you know, that threat from potentially turning off the thermohaline circulation, which would be what would happen at some point, history will tell you, that is what happens at some point as climate changes, there will come a point where all of a sudden that just turns off and, you know, the consequences to climate across the world, but particularly in our part of the world, are, are monumental. Um, and then just lastly on the marine pollution side, but very briefly, and um, I did some work very early on when um, ballast water was, you know, a thing. Now, I'd, I wasn't very good at naval architecture, but I was good enough to understand that the ballast water is a necessary evil. Um, so this is, if you like, this is a, a, a requirement. It's something we need when we're taking ships around the world. Um, and obviously at the time, there was a lot of concern, growing concern about invasive species. That concern you know, exists to this day, and it's not really a surprise. That water got picked up in wherever, Indonesia, and here it is in you know, France or whatever. But again, real credit to us, the maritime community, organizations like I'm Arrest, working with organizations like um, IMO and others in the way that we've got on top of this. And this has been from a regulatory point of view and obviously very much from a technology point of view. So it's a really nice example of environment, regulation, technology, engineering, all coming together um, to solve a, a very practical problem. Um, so the world of uh, maritime transport, um, I worked for, you know, for 16 years for BMT and therefore it was um, difficult to escape the world of maritime transport. Um, I spent um, uh, quite some time in my very early career working with very large vessel manoeuvring in, in Hong Kong with one of the world's um, leading um, hydrodynamic specialists. Um, and in particular, we were looking at how we got ships like that um, through waters, which a lot of you in this room will be familiar with, was, which was basically through Hong Kong, harbour and sling a left when you get to Ching Yi and Mawan Island and head on up, you know, as if you were going to the Pearl River. These particular ones were stopping off at, at, at Castle Peak. Um, and, you know, I, it was very interesting studying waterways where you'd got the combination of these huge vessels um, combined with a massive amount of local traffic, which undisciplined, unregulated local traffic. Um, I remember the, um, the barges used to come down from the Pearl River from, from mainland China, and they would get to them the, the, this very sharp right-hand bend, or bend to starboard, is that the right term? I don't know. Um, and they would basically, if they were on the ebb tide, they would sling their anchor over the back of the barge and literally drag the anchor around because that was the only way they were going to stop themselves going broadside and then end up sweeping you know, half the ships out of the anchorage um, down in Hong Kong, Hong Kong Harbour. Um, but again, in terms of that blend, you know, this was a very practical commercial problem. We needed to essentially open up the tidal windows to get these ships in and out to increase the capacity um, of the channel and particularly with thinking about China as an expanding mainland China as an expanding market at the time um, and but what I was doing was I was doing um, two things I was taking what was at the time a very novel new oceanographic instrument now very familiar the acoustic Doppler current profiler this was the very early days of them and also um, as I'll come on to in a second some what was at the time very novel technology using this weird thing called Microsoft Windows that this guy Gates had come up with um, and essentially what we were trying to do was to put a current meter on the seabed um, have it wired back remotely sent back to the vessel traffic center in Hong Kong and then using that to predict 
when the tidal windows would be um, amenable for vessels of this sort of size to get in and out around this particularly um, tight bend. Um, it was a disaster. And I learned a lot about, once again, about pitting oneself against um, the marine environment, um, trying to put an instrument like this um, in a very, very busy waterway, which as I've just described, was tended to be frequented by barges chucking their anchor over the back, meant that my cable back to the shoreline uh, tended to last you know, a few weeks at most, if I was lucky, before the thing got um, trawled up by an anchor. Um, it was also the days before any kind of mobile communications, um, and so I also had the joy of trying to do this over an analog telephone line um, in an area of the world frequented by a lot of electrical storms. So actually getting the data back uh, was quite a challenge at the same time as well. Um, but again, a lot of fun and a lot of learning about marine engineering, marine technology um, for very practical applications. Um, I spent a very brief period chairing um, a company in Australia uh, that was doing port development. And although this is something I would most definitely not profess to be an expert in, one of the things I did learn with them in a, in a short time was just how fabulously complex it is building a new port. And we were tending to operate in the Middle East, um, worked in places like Oman, Indonesia, um, the Black Sea. Um, and when you looked at how, how many disciplines had to come together in order to produce a new port, you know, all those planning dis disciplines, those logistics disciplines, just to get the thing scoped out, all the environmental issues that had to be taken into consideration, all the vessel traffic um, issues, the ship hydrodynamics, uh, a lot of hydrography and oceanography, um, and then, of course, all of the civil engineering and other sorts of engineering uh, that went into building one of these things. And frankly, when one stood with the sort of blank piece of coastline, it's a wonder we ever managed to ever get one of these things built because the amount of work that had to go in. And again, I think in, from an, in an IMRS point of view, while it's something that maybe we don't ma major a lot in, actually a lot of IMRS disciplines come together uh, in something like a, a port development. Um, navigation's been a little bit of a theme of my life um, in as much that I started uh, on my degree in nautical studies um, in those hazy days before this thing called GPS. Um, and therefore in year one um, was required to learn to navigate um, using celestial navigation, um, sextant and the astronomical tables, um, and spent a lot of my time studying INS, integrated navigation systems, that was an attempt to try and patch together things like Omega and Hyfix and Decker um, to vaguely try and get something that might give you a pretty reasonable idea as where your ship was. Um, but whatever you did, don't you know, make sure your Polaris isn't too far away um, because there was every chance that these things would go down or you were suddenly in a blind spot or whatever. Um, and that sort of lived with me over, over many years, but it came back again as things have a tendency to in my career. Um, when Sperry Marine was a part of my portfolio at Northrop Grumman. Sperry, as you know, a very, very long-standing um, company in the navigational area, and that's one of their amazing bridges. Um, uh, you know, th they put them on the QEC carriers, some of the biggest cruise ships in the world. And it, it just showed me over, you know, at the end of the day, what's a relatively short space of time, at least I like to think of that of it that way, um, since I left uni, some of it I still remember, you know, that we've got to this sort of state of the art in, in actually a relatively short space of time. I mean, it is a colossal a achievement of marine technology um, and marine engineering, as well as, of course, being a major contributor to marine safety. Um, so out of this obviously came the whole world of electronic charting, which I'll reference again in a second. However, uh, there is no room um, for complacency. Um, I spent a year or so in BMT chairing uh, BMT uh, marine surveys, um, and which basically you know, was a litany of things that had gone horribly wrong, um, and the marine surveyors going in, doing the investigations for one party or another. Um, and it constantly reminded you how close you were at any point in time to something really bad happening. And vessels are hazardous things. There's risk there the whole time. And managing that risk, I think, is one of the primary duties of marine scientists, marine technologists, marine engineers. Yeah, nothing justifies people getting injured or dying as a result of 
either human error in this particular case or engineering error um, or technological malfunction. Um, I'm not going to say this was an accident waiting to happen, but one was always slightly nervous about extremely large vessels with extremely large numbers of people on them who by definition were not experienced mariners um, and having a situation where you know the ship itself would have had the very best navigation systems the very best bridge systems all the best safety systems you can imagine and still people lost their lives on what was a foolish human error um, and uh, you know I, I read the, the back page, um, our, our summary in Marine Pro Professional, where there's a write-up of accidents that have happened, and it's that old Swiss cheese thing of that plus that plus that plus that, and all of a sudden somebody's lost their life. Um, so we can never, ever uh, be complacent on this one. Um, lastly, in the sort of maritime shipping world, um, I mentioned just now that I had a lot of fun in the early days um, with this um, thing that this chap Bill Gates had come up with, Microsoft Windows, um, because we adopted Microsoft Windows at a very early stage in a company that I formed in, in, in BMT, BMT Marine Information Systems, um, when we saw the power of providing the end user operator with the decision support tools. For what they were doing. So if you think back in, you know, to the, let's say the 1980s, oil spill prediction. Where's the oil spill going to go? Which coastlines it's going to hit? That would have been something where you'd have got the Proudman Oceanographic Laboratory or the Deakin Laboratory or something to spend a day running a model after the tanker accident, predicting where the, and they would have these big steaming machines in dark rooms producing reams of paper to tell you where the oil spill was going to go. That's great, except by the time you got the results, you know, it was all over the beach and you didn't really need a model to tell you. <clears throat> so what we were trying to do was to take these sort of modeling tools, modeling hydrodynamics, meteorology, the effects of, you know, the way oil sp spreads on a sea surface, or in this particular case, you know, where a distressed vessel or a life draft is likely to go under the action of tides and, uh, and, and wind, um, but to make it fast time and to put it in an environment, a user environment, which the operator could use. And this is a, an example, it's probably a bit of an old screenshot, but it's the easiest one I could find, um, of the search and rescue information system that we developed at the time. And it brought a lot of things together. It brought this sort of fast time modeling, this ability to predict um, currents in, in very fast time without having to run great big numerical models. Um, it brought together, in this case, the Her Majesty's Coast Guard's um, techniques for search and rescue, the whole planning side of it, the resource deployment side of it and it also brought at quite an early time electronic charting not being used just in navigational applications so when electronic charting came in clearly it was principally uh, for navigation but what we were doing was taking all that chart information and using that to overlay operational information in this particular case a planning scenario for search and rescue and I'm quite proud of this one um, it was a great partnership with HM Coast Guard but to this day this is the sort of world de facto standard for search and rescue systems you know many times developed on but still in that sort of Windows environment still with that ability for a Coast Guard to, to put in you know basic information and get results out operationally critical results out in a matter of, of minutes I had some fun in the offshore oil and gas industry. Um, huge respect uh, for an industry whose engineering is extraordinary and whose ability to solve problems is incredible. Um, this, I remember when this was brand new, and you can see from the picture, the state, it, I don't think it's there anymore, but the state it was in near end of life. And this was on the Atlantic margin. This was the first forays into, into ultra deep water, uh, drilling, and in this case, um, uh, production. I, w I was just, still to this day, I take my hat off to the offshore oil and gas industry for the way that they rapidly evolved technology and engineering to solve a problem. I mean, it was just incredible. You can actually track back to sort of, you know, nodding donkeys in the shallow waters of, of California. And in, in actually an incredibly short space of time, we've got to this sort of thing. I mean, it is, it, is, it is incredible, but it came with a huge number of challenges, um, you know, a lot of 
heavy duty operational oceanography went into these uh, into these vessels looking at these incredible shear currents that operated on the riser systems or on the mooring systems and again it brought to and then environmental impacts was a huge issue there um, I, I remember when they were looking at opening up the Faroe Island um, uh, area um, we went up there we were with a lot of the guys from the oil industry and we had the local experts in the Faroe Islands and they were telling, the ornithologist was on in the afternoon, I remember very distinctly, telling us about these amazing bird species in, uh, in the Faroe Islands and how sensitive they were and, and how you know, rare these populations were. And that evening we all went out to a restaurant and the menu read like the list of these endangered seabirds. Um, which, by the way, if you haven't ever eaten a seabird, don't. They are disgusting. Um, Something else I spent quite a bit of time on was this problem, and it, it was interesting just recently. I think the Marine Professional had an article in this literally like last month or something. And I read it and I thought, I did all the work, I did a load of work on cuttings pile decommissioning, which was really saying, here's the cuttings pile, what is the best way to deal with this? Do you just go down and dredge it up? Do you take away as much of the structure as you can and then go and remove it with specialist vessels? Do you cut the structures off here and just leave it with some sort of level of, of, of protection? You know, what is the solution to dealing with these pretty contaminated piles of toxic waste, which that's not too much of an exaggeration because that's pretty much what the legacy cuttings pile, certainly in the days of oil-based um, drilling muds, um, uh, were like. And I read the article and I thought, actually, we've kind of got nowhere with this because the article was talking about all the things that we were dealing with back in, well, I guess it was 20 years ago when I was working with the Norwegians, looking at what was the best way to deal with this problem. So this kind of feels like a challenge that's been around a long time. But again, I'm arrest, environmental impact issues, a lot of engineering relating to this, a lot of technologi technology potential solutions for dealing with this, uh, with this sort of impact. Um, so it's funny how these things go around and come around. Um, so I'm just going to move now on to the other end of en energy, um, the uh, renewable type. Um, and as Rob, when he introduced me, said, um, I had a lot of fun um, for uh, a couple of years um, with this animal, which was um, uh, marine, um, marine current turbines uh, sea gen tidal system. This is in Strangford Lock um, in Northern Ireland. Oh, it was. It's been decommissioned now. And at the time, it was, it was a 1.2 megawatt device um, and, a, you know, I think it probably still holds some of the records for um, electricity generation from a tidal device. Um, yet again, an incredible bringing together of engineering, science, and technology. Um, though I don't think Strangford Lock, there was an environmental designation that Strangford Lock didn't have. Um, so huge concerns about you know, these blades doing damage to the very large seal, popula seal population in the lock, as it turned out. They're not that stupid. Um, and we got great video of the pups playing on the turbine blades. Um, so, yeah, but nonetheless, precautionary principle um, and all that. Um, one of the difficulties for me here was that, I mean, I loved the engineering. And for me, as a, as a tidal scientist by almost original um, inclination, um, the idea that we were going to use the tide to generate electricity was like, it was very romantic to me. Um, but there was a difficulty here, um, and it's a difficulty that tidal energy um, has and shares to some extent uh, with animals like this uh, in wave energy. And, and in tidal energy, I mean, your fundamental challenge in the first instance is that water is a thousand times denser than air, and therefore the forces that it exerts are breathtaking, and you put a 16-meter blade into water, you are dealing with a very different kind of um, uh, in engineering challenge than, for example, when you put a 100-meter blade on a wind turbine. One of the things that we learned very quickly was that vibration engineering becomes super important. But, you know, vibration engineering's, I mean, in this area, it's quite a specialist discipline, and a lot of people had really cottoned on to the fact that left to their own devices, they would shake themselves to pieces. But when you're pummeling 
with the density of water, a blade, and it's a highly, um, it's a highly turbulent flow field that you're pummeling it with, all that vibration then gets transmitted back through the gearbox, through the, uh, the generator, and into the structure itself. And then you've got all the issues of resonant frequencies and so on. So what on the face of it you know, looked like quite a you know, straightforward piece of engineering actually comes su becomes super complicated very quickly. And you learn a lot with something like that, that that again looks quite simple, but the complexities in the system of systems. And there is a lesson again that stretched through my life is that you can get one bit right, you can get most of it right, you can get actually 98% of it right, but if as a system of system, it doesn't all hang together perfectly, it won't work. One bit of it will let you down. Now with tidal, you know, we think of the, the tides everywhere, current flows and so on. Now, when you actually do the analysis of the resource available, you find that there isn't as much of it as you think. Because once you've taken into account how fast the current has to flow to generate a meaningful amount of force, to generate a meaningful amount of electricity, and then when you factor in uh, bathymetry, difficult to put something particularly like this one in 300 meters of water, for example, when you factor in seabed conditions, Etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you find that the number of actual viable sites of the resource is quite small. This, on the other hand, does not have that problem. There is no shortage of waves, and these things, generally speaking, are, of course, sitting on the surface. But the trouble with these things is that they are inherently trying to do quite an inefficient thing, which is convert quite a small movement, in actual fact into motion to generate electricity. And so you end up building them at very large scale. And then what you find is that the difference between this thing operating in the sea state shown there, where it's probably not really generating an awful lot of electricity, the point at which it's doing it really, really well, and then that really annoying bit where there's a force 10, and I say very annoying because unfortunately, you know, it happens several times a year, so it's not one of those things, oh well, it'll be fine, it's a one in 50 year event. You find yourself engineering this thing for survival rather than electricity generation. And if wave energy has got a fundamental challenge associated with it, in my view, it is that you're basically trying to build a very large piece of engineering to survive extreme wave conditions, and then after that, hopefully generate some electricity. So this is, I think, a very challenged area. I remember writing essays on marine renewable resources and marine renewable devices back in the mid-'80s when I was at university. I caught the, excuse the pun, caught the wave again um, you know, in, in this period when I was with, with marine current turbines. But sad to say, you know, I think this is going to continue to be a really, really difficult problem for us as marine engineers and marine technologists to solve. I think we really have sort of met our match um, with harnessing uh, wave and tidal energy on, a, on an economic basis. And one of the reasons why this has become even more difficult um, is because of wind, offshore wind. Again, an area I know the Institute has, has, has got a lot of interest. And as this goes deep offshore and we're into floating foundations, you know, this will become a very big area for IMRS. It, it already is. Um, I'm chairman of a company called Kite Power Solutions, um, still at the you know, relatively early stages you know, with la large prototypes and so on. But the concept, as you can see from here, is essentially you know, instead of a wind, uh, a horizontal access mounted turbine, you're using a kite tethered um, to electrical generation um, on, on a platform. Um, it has some natural advantages that these things are you know, half a kilometer up, so they're harvesting air wind speeds that are much higher than they are down below, which is great. Um, you've also got forces that are reacting um, uh, on a much, much more acute basis. So when they resolve, it means you don't need anything like the amount of steel work for your foundation systems that you would when you've put a huge tower up and you've got a massive um, turbine blade that's trying to push the tower over. You don't get that problem here. But the point being that this is incredibly difficult technology as well. And taking this offshore, making it reliable and unmanned and autonomous, super, super, super difficult. So now for something completely different. Um, 2001, I went to run BMT Defence um, uh, um, Services, and 
joined just at the time that BMT was um, working with, at the time, Thales uh, in a competition with BAE Systems to design um, the aircraft carriers. Um, and I have to say, even though I, I mean I, I can't claim any credit for this, I turned up when BMT was uh, in the throes of designing this carrier, but to live the exercise of designing that aircraft carrier from a blank sheet of paper was amazing. I used to go over to Building 550 in Bristol Business Park and literally walk around amongst the engineers and the naval architectures as this incredible ship um, came together. Um, left BMT, joined MOD, and inherited the carrier program. Um, and had great times with people like Nigel in the audience here, um, not only producing an incredible bit of engineering, but fighting this through um, you know, MODs, approval systems, and contracts with contractors. Whilst this has got a lot of stick, uh, you know, it did end up twice as much as we hoped it was going to be in the first place. Um, it is a triumph in, in so many ways. It's an engineering triumph. We'd never done anything like this in 40 years. And, even then, nothing at this sort of scale. We were introducing such a lot of new technology. I mean, the US guys, to this day, cannot conceive how we are managing to man that carrier at the manning levels that we are. They're kind of like you know multiples of three, four times. Um, integrating an incredible new aircraft, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, which I had all through my MOD days, and then turned up at Northrop Grumman. There's a bit of a theme here about things repeating on me. Um, and Northrop Grumman was one of the major partners in, in F-35, so it's been another five years on the F-35 program. So when these pieces finally came together, which ironically was just after I'd left uh, Northrop, so last year when we finally got an F-35 onto the deck of a carrier, I mean, that was a, a massive moment for me. Um, there is a bit of a caveat to this. Um, and... I'll be slightly controversial here. Um, there's a question mark about the role of these types of capital ship in a peer-to-peer -peer environment of the future, or even of the current time. Um, the last 20 years has been an incredible time of the equation between attacking assets like this and defending them switching. And the Favour is firmly in the place of the attacker now. So that ability to detect something like this from a very, very, very long way away, acquire it, launch what are now relatively cheap, very high precision, very clever missiles at it, um, has meant that large vessels of this sort have got an intrinsic threat, which is going to be very, very difficult to defeat, particularly when you've only got one or two of them and losing it is a big deal. Um, the concept that the, the, word, the buzzword that's used is this anti-access area denial, where your adversary has the ability to basically push you so far away from their territory that you, you cannot be effective. And they do that by having very good missile attack systems. Um, the consequence of that is we have something that sometimes is called the tanker tether problem, and I sometimes call it the Dalek problem, in as much that the Daleks were really cool bits of fighting machinery, but they just couldn't cope with stairs. Um, so the easiest way to defeat them was just to run up the stairs. Um, the issue that you've got here is that you've got an air aircraft with a certain range, and actually it's relatively small, particularly if, if it's a Stovall aircraft. Um, so that means that you've got to refuel it. Your carrier needs to stand back sufficiently out of range of these very um, potent long-range missiles. So you've got to get your aircraft off the deck, that's fine, and then before you can get anywhere near the target, you need to refuel. And then you can get to your target, and then on the way back, you have to do the same thing. But there is a problem called the tanker, because the tanker is a wide-bodied airliner or similar type aircraft. And they're an absolute sitting duck. If it's easy to get a carrier with a long-range missile, it's extremely easy to get a wide-bodied airliner um, with, a, with a very cheap um, missile. And so it's called the tanker tether problem because there is a, a, a very fundamental question. In a contested environment, well, by which we're talking about peer adversaries of the Russia and China nature, in a peer environment, how are you going to get your weapon system to the target? And it's a ha I'll just leave it hanging there. It's quite a controversial thing to say when, particularly like me, you've spent 20 years um, producing this incredible bit of capability. But it is something we need to take very seriously. 
This is what's protecting it, of course, um, and it'll, I'm sure, do a, a jolly good job. Um, I've probably learned more lessons on one project, on this project in my life than any other. Lessons about contracts, commercial, manufacture, um, innovative technology. Um, I arrived in MOD in May 2006, and on my desk, and I am not joking, was a pile of paper. What's the pile of paper? 200 million pounds of claims from BAE Systems. Now there'll be the usual groan, well, you know, rich contractors, you know, what do you expect from BAE Actually, you know, most of it was the fault of the customer. Funny old thing. So I very quickly learned, it was my first time as the customer, and so I very le quickly learned some things about how do you specify, you know, one of the most complex engineering um, systems on a planet, and then expect a contractor to do it on a fixed sum, fix sum basis with the amount of risk there is. That, 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 that there is. Um, ultimately, the lesson there is a little bit like that, you know, if you, own the, if you owe the bank a little bit of money, it's your problem. If you owe them a lot of money, it's their problem. The same applies here. You know, ultimately, the government's bank balance is bigger than the balance sheet is stronger than even BA Systems um, balance sheet. And a contractor will simply get to the point where they're saying, I can no longer carry on doing this contract because I'm going to lose so much money that I'm better off just stopping now and giving you the bits. And that was sort of where it was when I turned up. Um, the, one of the other lessons I learned here is, I mean, we, this is, again, a breathtaking ship. I was on the sea trials for, for Daring. Um, I was at the launch of Dauntless, Diamond, and Duncan. And I cut first steel on Diamond. So I had a long run involvement with this. And in particular, um, with the incredible um, integrated electrical propulsion system on the ship. Again, in another one of those... I've been here before moments. I did find myself only two years ago, 18 months ago even, um, in front of the Defence Committee, this time in my Northrop role, and you're thinking like, where the heck did that come from? Well, because Northrop had originally designed the recuperator on the WR21, um, which in itself was an incredible piece of technology, the whole WR21 with recuperator, from the point of view of an extremely efficient gas turbine, everything you want on a warship, you know, goes a long way for not very much fuel, fantastic, um, brilliant if you're going to produce lots of them. But when you then have a change of mind after having produced not very many of them and decide perhaps you're not going to do that anymore, that's a problem. So the starting point for me of the problems on Type 45 was an orphan prime mover um, plus a very complex integrated propulsion system which when we put it, brought it all together and it's been in the press, it's no, it's no news, We've had a lot of issues on this on this ship, particularly around around blackouts. Now, I think we're you know that that's getting solved now. Again, thank you, marine engineers. But I kind of feel we bit off slightly more than we could chew. And that was even having done the important things like the electro electric ship technology demonstrator up at um, up at Alston, which was you know, essentially took half a ship and, and mimicked it you know with all of the plant. Um, but it just goes to show how. On the one hand, something that looks quite simple, propelling a warship, you know, we've done that before, can become very complex for, for good reason in some senses, but in other senses you're creating a lot of risk. By the way, you know, whilst we were doing a first ever on the marine engineering, we were also doing a first ever on the missile system, on the combat system, the radar. There's basically nothing on that ship that wasn't pushing the envelope of the technology. The fact that we've got, you know, the best destroyer on the on the seas is a testament to the engineering and technology that went into it. But oh my God, we sweated um, to get there, and to some extent have sweated ever since. Um, lastly, on the naval story, um, this is HMS Astute, which I um, which I brought into service in MOD. I love submarines. I mean, these are my favourite bit of engineering. Um, I can't think of any other engineering system on the planet which brings together so many disciplines in one place. I mean, it's almost try and find a discipline, an engineering discipline, or for that matter, a technology discipline, that does not turn up in a nuclear submarine somewhere. Just the whole idea of what you're trying to achieve here. You know, this thing that will dive to great depths with nuclear missiles in it, with a nuclear reactor in it, with you know, the health and welfare and habitability for 100 plus people. Uh, and, and be able to do that for days and days and days, or months on end. I mean, it's just mind-bending. Um, so I love these, just for the sheer challenge in them. The other thing I love about them is that this is where the future lies. And I don't necessarily mean 
huge submarines like this, although I think they have a role to play. But I believe the future uh, in defense is going to lie in the underwater world. And why do I say that? It goes back to what I was saying earlier about anti-axis area denial. This is the last hiding place on Earth. This is the place where it's very difficult to find things. We proved that, trying to find an airliner for, you know, for years. Um, this is a brilliant place to go and put things that you don't want other people to find. Um, I think if you take the advances on underwater technology, and if you add a very large dose of autonomy, information systems, intelligence gathering sensors, you've got what to me is the future of, of defense systems. Space can be denied. Virtually nothing that isn't super stealthy will survive in the air. Any large ship, highly vulnerable. Every land system imaginable, easily defeatable. This and all the little things that should go with it, the autonomous systems, the unmanned systems, the remotely deployed systems, the all of those are, in my view, how we're going to protect um, our nation in the future. So I'm hoping that one day we're going to wake up to this and we will see a renaissance of underwater defense that we haven't seen since the 1950s. But it needs a lot of money redirected into research, technology, development. Again, super exciting for the IMRS. It's got all of the things we're, we're really good at. So I'm hoping and praying that we'll see 25 years of massive investment um, in this area. And so finally, uh, and I did particularly want to end um, with this, um, because I think this is, of all the topics I've talked about tonight, um, in my view, the biggest, the most worrying, and that is climate change. Um, so I went down to Antarctica in 2004 with British Antarctic Survey for a visit, and it was a very, it was one of those very, I mean, going down to Antarctica is, excuse the pun again, super cool. I mean. It's just the most incredible place to spend some time. Um, but it was also the most, you know, one of the most seminal few days of my life because it brought home to me the reality of what we were talking about when people were saying the global warming, things are warming up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I was able to see them taking these ice cores, slicing these little thin slices of ice core, putting them on your tongue, and when you put it on your tongue, the warmth of your tongue melted the water and it felt like popcorn on your, on your tongue, which was the little bubbles of compressed carbon dioxide, or compressed air, popping open on your tongue. And that, that air that was popping on your tongue was 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 years old. So you're thinking, wow. I mean, we really have got a climate record here. You know, the last time that was floating around was 20,000 years ago. Amazing. Um, and of course, you've all seen plots like this, but this was, you know, if I needed a conversion, this was it. Um, this is actually just a, a you know, these, these, are, these I think um, they're, they're at least back 800,000 years on these cores now, it might be more now, um, which I think is about four cycles, you know, ice, ice age cycles. So this is a super, um, you know, recent one. This is only going back to the year 1000 AD, um, but it's, you know, got your PPM of carbon dioxide, which, you know, we've got a direct relationship between temperature and carbon dioxide and then it's just showing here start of the industrial revolution and this thing just takes it to the skies and the abruptness of that is I mean you've got times when we've been up to these levels and I'll come to that in a second but it's taken like thousands of years instead we managed to do it in a hundred never in 800,000 years of ice core record do you see do you see this if that's not a wake up, I have no idea what it is. So then they fly me down the peninsula, and we go to this place called Fossil Bluff. Now, Fossil Bluff is a polar landscape. We're in Antarctica. Lots of snow and glaciers and good stuff. They take me first to this site here, and you'll see there, in the middle of that picture, this sort of rock column. That's a fossilized tree from when Antarctica was basically tropical rainforest. So that's a fossilized tropical tree in a polar landscape. Then we went back to the glacier, which is a, a decaying glacier, and I've got, and it's on my mantelpiece at home, a very small rock with a fossilized seashell. And that was when 
in the same location, well, it's literally 25 meters along the, the rock, it was all ocean. So the whole of Antarctica was covered in sea. So I was standing there with a tropical rainforest here, completely underwater here, and then today, 2004, standing in a polar landscape. So I think those, the, the combination of those two things for me said, we are screwing this up in the most extraordinary way. And I'm sorry to say, I think it's unstoppable. I mean, I, I can't see that humanity is taking anything like the actions it needs to, to abate the, the, the source of the problem. And even if we do, the amount of inertia that you have in a climate system is colossal. So the time it takes, yeah, we talk about time to take, turn super tankers around. I mean, this is a super tanker on a colossal scale, so to speak. Um, and then if you then add for extra drama, the tipping points where you will get an abrupt event which is triggered by the climate change, but then suddenly, let's say, turns off the thermohaline circulation in the Atlantic. Deeply scary. I wish that everybody, but let's say just as a minimum, anybody in every country in the world who's got any sort of decision power in government or other organizations, I believe if they could just go down to the Antarctic Peninsula for a day and see what I saw, I think we would have a very, very different set of actions being taken across the globe on climate change. I want to say a massive thank you to Ima Rest because every single thing I've talked to you about tonight, Ima Rest has been like stick a rock all the way through it. I've been 25 years in the Institute. I've pretty much shown, shown you everything I've done, more or less, and every single example has got Ima Rest running through it, multiple bits of Ima Rest. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a technology, te not technologist. I'm this marine mongrel who brings all these bits together and thrives in it. I love it. I hate it when we start partitioning and pigeonholing and have engineers here and technologists here. Just about everything I've worked on is a blend of bringing technology, engineering and science together. And that is why I think I'm Arrest has such a strong role to play um, in our world today. Thank you so much for listening. I hope I haven't bored you, um, and I'm happy to take a question or two. Andrew, thank you. That was just fantastic. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more later, but there's now time for questions. Uh, questions from the floor, and we'll also perhaps be getting some online questions as well as we go through. So, um, anything to start us on from uh, from here in Trinity House? Okay. Please, yeah. Case. <laughs> Sorry, um, I was wondering whether you could kind of give us a good scenario for the planet and a bad scenario. I mean, in a sense, I suppose you've already given us the bad one. Um, but, you know, the as, somebody, as somebody who isn't a climate scientist, it's very difficult to do that without being glib and saying, on the one hand, let's get an awful lot of world leaders down to the Antarctic Peninsula and show them a few things or two. And at that point, then, you know, put every measure we can consider into place to stop the warming of the planet at source, notwithstanding what I said about the inertia. But that, you know, that's got to be your starting point of your best case scenario. I haven't a clue, and I don't think there's probably even a specialist climate modeler who will absolutely hand on heart and say they, 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 they can tell you what's going to happen next if you just stopped. Because um, the system, you know, if, if ever there was a system of systems, it's planet Earth. It's such an incredibly complex system of feedback loops. Um, worst case, well, it's difficult to see us doing any worse than we are at the moment. Um, as in, you know, our efforts have been fairly tokenistic, if we're really honest, you know, for the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. And I think that the symptoms are now popping up all over the place. Um, whether it's you know, coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef, whether it's the fact that you know, my boyhood home of Sussex is 
shortly going to take over from the Champagne region as one of the best sparkling wine producers um, in Europe. I mean, you know, the evidence for the symptoms are, is just legion. I mean, look at the, you know, for somebody, you know, for a country led by somebody who doesn't believe in climate change and is getting some of the most extreme climate-driven climate, climate -driven events in, in, in the country with this severity and frequency of hurricanes. I mean, all those things are all off the back. They're symptoms of this underlying chronic climate change. So I don't know what it takes for humanity to wake up and smell the coffee, but I'm, I feel very pessimistic that it's not going to happen in my lifetime. And then, of course, you're looking at it and saying, well, that's a nice legacy to leave, isn't it? I mean, you know, our generation, I'm looking around the room, I'm sorry to say it pretty much is our generation, you know, has presided over this. The generation before might have pleaded ignorance. But we were the generation where all of this got discovered, where, the, where this is no longer, you know, this is scientific fact, and yet we've just carried on globally um, doing much the same thing. So I didn't want to leave the, you know, leave the evening on a depressing note, but I am very pessimistic. Yeah, Barry. Andrew, fascinating uh, range of topics there. I'm trying to get a feel, though, of what you think the future is of tidal energy. You chose a couple mm. of examples. You didn't talk about the seven barrage and those sorts of things. Yeah. Is there a future for that type of technology for power generation? I think my point around tidal is that the, from an engineering perspective, this is entirely tractable. Whether it's um, tidal barrier systems, which are you know, very large bits of concrete, if we're really blunt about it. That's, you know, hydro's been around a long time and a, it's just a low, low, um, uh, low hydro, whatever they call it, um, uh, low head hydro. Um, free stream tidal, which is what I was involved in, is really, really tricky. I mean, I'm watching the Maygen project up in, up in Scotland and all strength to their elbow if they pull that off. I mean, that is a, that's a vicious tidal stream to be operating in. Um, it's probably, well, it's not probably, it is the best tidal resource in the UK. So if we can do it there, fantastic. That'll be a great credit to some amazing marine engineering. But then when you start to look how much more there is around the waters of the UK, there's some, but there's not a massive amount. And I think you know, therein lies the challenge, because if you look at wind energy and how the incredible job they've done in bringing the levelized cost of energy down, it, a lot of that's come off scale just the sheer number of wind turbines and the engineering and the repeatability and they just they're so good at them they've managed to bring the cost down and down and down that only comes from economies of scale and economies of learning if you're actually relatively constrained in the number of sites that are viable where are you going to get the scale from so I, I have a I'm not giving up on it I think if it's if it's um, expected to stand on its own two feet for a long period of time that will be very difficult I mean economically um, so it will need a hell of a lot of subsidy, and I think what, if anything's challenged marine energy more than anything, it's been, and credit to them, offshore wind, because that has brought the levelized cost of energy down to levels that I never thought were, were going to be possible anytime soon. So um, that, that obviously, at the end of the day, money counts. Levelized cost of energy is the, the killer metric in the, uh, in the um, electricity industry. I did a simple math a few months ago. Uh, uh, a tanker or a, or a, a container ship uh, pollutes about the same amount as a million cars a day in pollutant. Do you know if there's anything being done on banning heavy fuel on ships in the future? Is anybody talking about it? Um, I think there's plenty of people talking about it. I am. This is one of many areas which I have little or no expertise whatsoever. Um, I mean, where I've had a brush with this has more been in, you know, for example, we were looking, because I've just, I'm chairman of a kite company, the idea of using kites as a source of power originally came from kite assistance on, on ships. Um, and that's about as close as I've got to, you know, fuel sources for, for ships, if I'm honest. But I am aware that within the Institute, I'm pretty sure I'm aware in the Institute, this is an area of, of significant um, knowledge and, and expertise, which is what I'd expect from a, from a shipload of, of marine engineers. Um, I'm just probably not the right person to ask the question of, so sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, Andrew, thinking of a young person entering the field of marine engineering, science uh, and technology today, where would you direct them to perhaps uh, expend their efforts for maximum benefit? That's a brilliant question. 
And in, in the first instance, what I, what I try to do is to generate that sense of excitement about this world. And I suppose, being slightly self-referential here, allow people to see what the breadth of the opportunity is. And you know, just what I've shown you this evening, I think is within anybody's abilities. You know, there are lots of people who like to have a specialization, and thank God for that, because they actually really know what they're talking about, unlike me. Um, you know, we, we need people who've got areas of specialization. But I think what is lovely about the marine world is that ability to come into it, and over the course of a career, develop it in so many different areas. And even if you're a specialist, I mean, we found this you know, in, the, in the renewable energy industry. I mean, all the people, all the engineers there were offshore oil and gas engineers or you know, commercial shipping engineers or whatever. I mean, it was the same core disciplines and skills being applied in a completely different application domain. And I, I mean, I'm not gonna say that's unique, but I do struggle to think of a sector where the world is your oyster to the extent that it is within the marine world. And if you decide that you're going to plot a course over there that takes you away from maybe your first studies and you do some different studies or you go and research something or you go into a company that's doing something over here, I mean, literally you can go anywhere with it. So rather than saying, this is super cool, go and do that. I mean, you know, I, I genuinely mean it. There's very little I've shown you tonight that hasn't given me enormous pleasure and fulfillment at a given point in my, my career. And at that point in that career, I'd have taken a young person and said, oh my God, naval defense, it is epic, or coastal defenses are so interesting, or come and do renewable energy, it's, you know, it's the future. I mean, I, I can get people excited about just about any topic I've talked about this evening, very genuinely and in a heartfelt way. I might make the comment, sir, that something you said in your introduction, I think, is the key to the answer to the last question. You had a lot of fun doing it. So did I. And I'm still having fun. Just being a member of the Institute is still fun. It's not as much fun as, as, uh, as working, <laughs> but it's still fun. Oh, I, I, fun is the word I probably use. Well, fun is the word I use most in my workplace when I'm working with my teams. I actually don't think, I mean, we are on the planet for too short a period of time to not be having fun. We spend far too much time in work if it's not fun. And I think one of the joys about being a professional is that you've effectively earned the right to have those options to have a lot of fun. And I think you know, we're enormously privileged because there are a lot of people who do jobs and their, their work is not fun under any circumstance. But I'd, I'd be disappointed if I found a member of the Institute who couldn't say hand on heart, I've had a lot of fun and hopefully are, are still continuing to have a lot of fun. So yeah, fun's a big thing for me. So uh, you're presenting us with, a, with a, a lovely breadth across the E, the S, and the T of the Institute. And you're binding it together with the MAR pipe. So you, you really are, in this talk you've given us this evening, you're representing what we as an institute are trying to do. So you've got a presidential year ahead of you here. And you're taking this experience and you're bringing it into the presidential year. Yeah. Have you got a sense, just from an excitement point of view, what you're planning to do with your, ex your presidential year? Because your, your journey doesn't stop with that slide. It keeps going. I'd like to well, hear where it's going. Well, that's true. That is true. So I'm told by Rob. Um, <laughs> so I think, I mean, there, are, there is a couple of themes that I am particularly want to be focused on. And I will sneak preview, talk briefly about this in my speech tomorrow night. And I wasn't, I guess what I'm hoping is that my background is unusual to the extent that I will be very disappointed if I, have a, if I can have a conversation with anybody I meet during my presidential year that I can't have a, you know, a meaningful conversation with. Be that a marine biologist or a marine technologist in some advanced bit of marine technology, electronic engineering, whatever, or really any of the fields of engineering, or for that matter, with the exception of emissions, atmospheric emissions from ships, which I've now discovered I know nothing about. Um, but I, 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 I'd bet myself to be able to have a, you know, a good conversation with anybody, and so I hope that helps accessibility, um, that I'm not seen as somebody who's from one <coughs> camp or another camp. Uh, the things I want to go after, actually, are really around, I mean, topics that have come up today in conversation, around 
youth is the lifeblood of the future organization. So the question about how do we excite young people, and I don't just even mean graduates here, I understand that's often and rightly so an area of focus for us because they're the ones that are going to be a revenue source soonest. But you know, I love going into schools. I love talking to school kids about this stuff and planting some of those really early seeds that may germinate into careers in the marine world and then hopefully de facto why would they not want to be a member of the IMRS? Um, and then the other one which you know is again it's come up today a few times is our lack of gender diversity in an institute that is like all about diversity in in so many other respects and you know what I've chatted about this evening you know is a is a measure of diversity the interdisciplinarity but our gender diversity is shocking and we're just missing out on such an incredible opportunity in the institute so I'm hoping in the modest way one can only expect to in a year as the president that we might be able to make a few um, you know inch stone progress um, on our, our gender balance in the in the Institute um, and some of that may be about also our interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity as well because we know that the gender balance differs in different disciplines and therefore maybe one of the ways of enriching the Institute with more females is actually to to, to have more people coming in in some other discipline areas that are maybe not the traditional um, established discipline areas of the of the Institute so you know, wish me luck with that one because I know that's a hard nut to crack because I've been doing it all my working life pretty much. Um, but it has almost annoyed me that I've had a career in the marine world all the way through and I've been in environments where it's the gender balance has been 50-50 in, in the marine world and then I've been in another bit of the marine world and it's like, you know, you're struggling to find a female anywhere and that, that just can't be right. We've got an online question now. Thank you. Uh, first, I'm going to take the opportunity now, I've got the mic, to um, answer Eve's question on heavy fuel oil, um, which the IMO member states have moved to ban in the Arctic. And if you wish to keep up, please join the emissions from shipping special interest group. Um, there's some information on special interest groups on your chair. Um, the questions actually come from someone in the room, so kudos to John Chudley for using the online system. Um, it works. Thank you, John. Um, and <laughs> that was John's anonymous question. Was that? God, uh, there is an anonymous question, but that was from me, testing it worked. Um, and that is, your first degree was very broad and taught in the main by practitioners. Was that a strength for your career, and do we now encourage specialisation too early? Um, so I, I am a generalist by instinct. So I think even if I'd done quite a specialist degree in the first place, <clears> I'd ended up generalising. And it's kind of because I've, nearly re I've never really found something I'm super good at. So I've thought quite early on that rather than try and be a specialist, which I wasn't very good at, my PhD definitely taught me that, I was not cut out to be a research scientist, that better I had a more broader base. Um, and you know, it's fair to say that in, in the last you know, 10, 15 years, I have been probably a bit longer than that actually, this millennia, I've really been more in the, in the sphere of general management, albeit very rooted within the, um, within the marine world. Um, so, d I mean, I think there is a tendency for specialization too early, and I am a great advocate of having the broadest base possible, um, particularly so when, as I think I've illustrated tonight, pick any one of those examples I've used, it's all, you know, the solution there, whatever form it's taken, has been about bringing in multiple disciplines together. And I think that in the environments I've worked in, interdisciplinarity works best when people have their specializations but they also have a broad appreciation of how the other disciplines contribute because it's quite difficult you know if you know not the first thing about metallurgy and you are a vibration specialist and you're trying to solve the sort of problems that we had on our tidal turbine um, you know you need engineers to be talking together and I think for people to talk they've got to have a bit of an understanding where the other ones um, coming from um, I think the lovely thing about the marine world is it it's sort of almost in and of itself promotes a broader way of thinking and I'm sure you know most of you in the audience here even if you might consider yourself having a sort of core specialization you know would also understand that you're operating in a very interdisciplinary world and you've got a pretty good feel for a lot of those other technology science and engineering disciplines which influence the the area that you're you're working in I don't think that's 
common in a lot of other application areas where I think you'll find people are super specialist and they stay in their little box. I think that's one of the lovely things about you know, the world we all, we've all chosen to pursue our careers in. Any other questions? Yeah, please. It, I work for a, a Commonwealth organizations, and last year uh, at the Heads of Government meeting here in London, they launched the Blue, the blue Charter. Uh, I mean, a third of the Commonwealth countries, small island states, and nearly everyone has a, a coastal region. Yeah. And I wonder how much can EMARIST help the Blue Charter to develop? Because this is to involve local people around. Yeah, no, I, I think that, that that's fantastic. I have to plead ignorance here, and I hadn't heard of that. But what I have spent a lot of my life doing is, you know, I showed you the Thousand Islands in Indonesia. I spent a lot of time working in Southeast Asia in, in coastal areas with sort of small populations that were heavily dependent on the sea. I spent, you know, a few years when I was a youngster in the, living in the Solomon Islands, and I've been back there a couple of times. And that really brings home to you how small communities in in small coastal areas. The symbiosis that they've got with the, with the sea is, is really fundamental to their life because they literally subsist off the, the sea beside them. Um, and they, are heavily, they get heavily influenced by factors that are right outside of their control. Things that are like plastics, for example, is a really good example. You know, they're on this very remote Solomon Island, and I've seen it with my own eyes, and the beach is you know, strewn with plastic that would have come from hundreds of miles away. Um, so I would, if there's a way that the IMRS can <coughs> create bridges with you know, communities like that and, and make a, a, a difference at a more local scale, if that's something that we could you know, get the ability to do, I think that would be amazing. Adopt a tropical island. I'm up for that. Maybe that would be a <laughs> presidential <laughs> commitment. <clears throat> Any more questions, please? Okay, anything online? Okay, in which case we'll, we'll draw that to a close, Andrew. Thank you. I think we've, we've gone from pollution, energy, defense, um, the environment, um, covered a whole range of topics there, which is a canter through your career, I know, but a fascinating career and insight into the evolution of technology in, in our environment that, that we all know and love and, and share Andrew's passion, I think. I think, it's, I think it's, it's, it's comforting to know that given the right conditions, areas of, of, our, of nature can recover, but it's seriously worrying to understand you know, how bad the planet is currently being affected and whether we're doing enough, probably not, to put it right for our successors and generations to come. Equally, in the meantime, Defence is fascinating. I'm really fascinated that our perhaps our underworld, under underwater world, is the future of our def our defence, which again takes us into some fascinating areas. The complexity, I think, of the different um, the different technologies that you've you've shown to us that need to come together, and your fascination for submarines, I, I can see entirely, because it really does bring a lot together. So if we can operate a submarine but in an environmentally friendly way as well. We've probably cracked the whole, the whole issue. I think that was fantastic. I think you've, you've shown us real excitement, as you say, in everything, all those different areas. It shows that there's opportunity, huge opportunity for people out there, whether you're a specialist, whether you're a generalist, the opportunities in our marine industry are out there to grasp, and, and it's exciting, and we share your excitement. So, Andrew, thank you, please. Can we...